The reason I chose to view the bicentenary from a, a personal point of view rather than try to do something more encompassing is because I presumed and presumed correctly that the Light to the World film, which most of you probably received in the last few days, if you have not, then your community will soon, did uh, the kind of job that, that only the World Center could do. And it's a w wonderful presentation, and I'm sure those of you who are utilizing it to uh, advertise the bicentenary and use it as a teaching device will be most pleased. So I decided that the, the most I could do would be to uh, say what uh, the bicentenary means to me on a personal level. And so uh, I titled the, the talk, What the Bicentenary of the Birth of Baha'u'llah Means to Me. Uh, I'm going to begin with uh, the... Uh, discussion of the word mezan, or proof. Uh, that is, the word mezan is an Arabic word meaning standard or balance. And so uh, I'm going to talk about who Baha'u'llah is or who he became for me, how he became my mezan, the standard by which I live, and my friend, which may sound too casual to use with a manifestation of God, but of course we use the word the friend and the uh, poetry alluding to the manifestation, and that's what I, that's why I capitalize it. Um, first, uh, I want to speak a bit about how I acquired belief or faith in Baha'u'llah, and we necessarily then go to what we mean by faith, because most religions uh, accept faith as believing that which you cannot prove. Uh, or at least prove objectively. Um, though anything we think is proven for us in some way. But of course the Baha'i definition is more specific. It links together two things. The Baha'i definition says, by faith is meant first conscious knowledge, and second the practice of good deeds. And this of course is reminiscent of the first paragraph in the Gitabi Agdas, which says there are two obligations to every human being to recognize the manifestation and to follow his uh, guidance for our lives. And he says, Baha'u'llah, in that same paragraph, uh, that after we do these two things, we need to do them over and over again, back and forth, that it's a, recip a reciprocal relationship between these two processes that neither is acceptable without the other. So in an effect, you can't really said to have recognized the manifestation if you're not obedient to his ordinances. Conversely, you can do good deeds, but if you don't understand the manifestation or how these deeds relate to the coming of the manifestation, then they are incomplete. They are worth something, but it's not the same thing. So, we then go to the, how do we acquire conscious knowledge of the manifestation? Because uh, you can say, well, you uh, met some Baha'is and you like them very much and so on. But of course, anything we do in the faith, whether it's acquiring knowledge or carrying out the um, attempt to acquire attributes, is a process. There aren't any certain, certain points of transformation. There's certain points of um, enlightenment, certainly, but everything we do is a process of doing, uh, not only in this life, but in the life to come. So, uh, there are proofs. Uh, we may not think that word is, is very enticing. It may sound kind of cold and aloof, but uh, everything we do that acquaints us with the manifestation and provides us belief in the manifestation is some sort of proof. And Abu Baha, when he's talking about this very subject, he talks about four uh, ways that we can acquire proof. Uh, he says proofs are of four kinds. There are four criterions 
uh, are standards of judgment by which the human mind reaches its conclusion. And the first, obviously, sense perception. Second, through the faculty of reasoning. Third, from the uh, from traditional or scriptural authority. And fourth, through the medium of inspiration. Now, he goes on in this same discussion, which can be found, as you can see, on the foundations of world unity, to say all four of these individually are, can be faulty. The, uh, they aren't necessarily correct, and he discusses in this same uh, context how they can be faulty. Uh, they are liable to error or mistake and error in conclusions. But when you combine them, uh, a statement presented to the mind accompanied by proofs which the senses can perceive to be correct, which the faculty of reason can accept, which is in accord with traditional authority and sanctioned by the promptings of the heart, can be adjudged, adjudged and relied upon as perfectly correct, for it has been proved and tested by all the standards of judgment and found to be complete. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that we can acquire some sort of infallibility through this process. We're always in a, again, a process of understanding and establishing the truth. And the same thing is true with a belief in Baha'u'llah. Uh, we reach, as anyone of you who is a Baha'i knows, that you go through various stages of confirmation of your belief. And it never stops. Um, and so, how do we apply these four standards to those who claim to be a manifestation? Uh, there are in the uh, kitab i Gan, which of course is meant to be a proof or uh, an apologia, proving the station of the Bab. It was revealed by Baha'u'llah in 1862, but it's not proving his station, it's proving the station of the Bob, even though he goes on to say that the standards of proof in this work are sufficient to prove the validity of any of the prophets that you can apply them. And at the end of the work, he sort of summarizes these proofs, and these aren't the, this isn't the only tablet where he talks about the proofs, uh, but he says, first of all, is the book itself. Uh, this is the first one he mentions, though in other places he says the greatest proof of the prophet is the prophet himself. So uh, the ability to uh, spontaneously bring forth verses without any uh, uh, editing, without any uh, re revision and so forth, this ability is one proof of the prophet. Uh, second, the evidence that a prophet has come is that souls of sterling character appear to proclaim the advent. So we think in the case of the Bab, we think of uh, Sheikh Ahmad or, or Sayyid Kazim. Uh, and of course, with Baha'u'llah, we think of the Bab himself. So he says, among the proofs demonstrating the truth of this revelation, is that in every age and dispensation, wherever the invisible essence was revealed in the person of his manifestation, certain souls, obscure and detached from all worldly entanglements, would seek illumination from the sun of prophethood and the moon of divine guidance, and would attain into the divine presence. Uh, this he calls the divinely appointed touchstone, the martyrs to the cause, in other words. So we think of the naturally with the Bob, the letters of the living, uh, particularly uh, Hodus, Mullah Hussein, and Tahirai. Uh, the third proof that he uh, gives in the, and you can see the page numbers here in the Gan if you're interested, and this uh, PowerPoint will be available, so if you don't get something down, don't worry about it. The constancy of the prophets in proclaiming the faith. Now here, this would be the same as uh, the, the, the personhood of the prophet himself is, one, is a, the, a powerful proof of who he is. And in particular here, he's talking about constancy in spite of all they must undergo. He was afraid, he's talking about the Bob. He was afraid of no one. He was regardless of consequences. 
could such a thing be made manifest except to the power of divine revelation and the potency of God's invincible will? Steadfastness in the faith is a sure testimony and a glorious evidence of the truth. Finally, the transmuting influence. Uh, he says, among the evidences of the truth of his manifestation were the ascendancy, the transcendent power and supremacy, which he, the revealer of being and manifestation of the adored, adored hath unaided and alone. And that uh, phrase, unaided and alone, is used frequently. And it's very important for us to think about it because uh, we think uh, of Baha'u'llah in, in prison uh, the last 40 years of his life. And as we will see later, we see what his, uh, what uh, emanated from him alone and unaided. And you can say, well, he had the aid of Abu Baha and so on. But it means essentially that without any uh, uh, assistance from worldly powers. So in the year 60, this would be 1844, uh, he appeared in Shiraz and asunder the veil of concealment, than the signs of, uh, uh, I think that should be that, the signs of ascendancy, might, the might, the sovereignty, power emanating from that essence of essences and sea of seas were manifest in every land. And finally, one that he says, I, I don't like to use these. <laughs> he says they're unreliable and can be... Uh, interpreted in so many different ways, but for the benefit of those who like them, I'll, I'll interpret them. So the last thing he does, uh, Baha'u'llah does, uh, he shows how to interpret uh, some of the more important traditions about the appearance of the Qaim or of the Bab. Some other objective metrics proving the influence of Baha'u'llah. So in other words, those four proofs he uses for the Bob, we can use as well for him. Uh, but there are, as we, uh, um, as I said, this is a personal reflection of my own, uh, but when I first became a Baha'i, or what attracted to me faith, were not subjective. To many people, they are. They fall in love with the Baha'is, they fall in love with the spirit of the faith, but uh, I didn't know any Baha'is. I knew about the faith, and so uh, I approached it in a very objective manner. What were the objective proofs, uh, the met objective metrics I put here, proving the influence of Baha'u'llah, are uh, following up with this same line of thought about faith, uh, uh, enabling us to obtain conscious knowledge. Um, what are the miraculous results of Baha'u'llah's life? We could go on for quite some time. The movie um, that uh, The Light to the World uh, is certainly uh, enumerates and demonstrates those, that his faith is spread throughout the world. Uh, from him emanated the second most widespread religion in the world during the course of 174 years. Without seeking power or aligning himself with the powerful, his influence has spread worldwide. And this is incredibly important. And that is, you think of Christianity and how it spread throughout the, uh, the part of the world that was known in the West at the time, the Western world. It did so primarily, uh, most immediately, because it was utilized by rulers such as Constantine to unify uh, their empires and, and so on. And so it was spread in conjunction with the spread of secular power. Not so, of course, with the Baha'i faith. Indeed, secular power attempted to destroy the faith. Never before has a movement spread like this without the vested interest of the rich and powerful. I could go on lecture for a couple of hours on this thesis of mine. You can uh, accept it as you wish, but uh, uh, I believe it's true. Never before has the founder of a revealed religion secured the religion against schism or perversion. And of course, this is a whole discussion of the covenant that never before was it possible for a manifestation to write in his own, his own hand 
uh, the uh, succession and the covenant for the religion. And of course, that covenant has now been secured since the election of the House of Justice in 1963. Another objective proof, again, objective to me, from this simple room looking out on a narrow street in Akka, in a prison city, emanated the Kitab Agdas, the most holy book of this dispensation, a blueprint for transforming society and bringing about world peace. Again, each one of these we could talk about for literally for hours, but we won't today. Baha'u'llah calls this, which I'm sure you will recognize from the shape of, of the promontory there, to this. And again, with money coming from and support coming only from the followers of Baha'u'llah who have nothing to gain from it, all anonymous gifts, that is miraculous and an objective proof as far as I'm concerned. And this, if you'll notice that circle there, that's the shrine of the Bab, the way Abdu'l Baha built it. And it hasn't changed since then, other than uh, some addition onto the back of it, and of course, the uh, crown of glory that it has become on top, the superstructure designed by Sutherland Maxwell, assisted by Shoghi Effendi. Isn't that wonderful from that? to that. And from Baha'u'llah emanated spiritual forces sufficient to change the world to focus on a, uh, focusing on a simple shrine for one who was born into this world 200 years ago. We have the Qibla, which is the point of adoration towards which we uh, turn to pray every day. And this simple structure is in effect where you, when you go there, I'm sure you, those of you who have gone, you sit outside that shrine and think of all of the spiritual powers that are emanating from that sacred dust and also coming in towards it from all points of the world. It's, it's a, a wonderful thing to think about, isn't it? Now we go to subjective metrics. Now, I don't mean to uh, imply I have given you all the objective. This is my story, uh, how I became a Baha'i, <clears throat> and what Baha'u'llah means to me. Are as much as I can explain in about 45 minutes. Um, I was raised uh, as a Methodist and uh, uh, stayed a Methodist until the age 19 when I became a Baha'i as a sophomore in college. So I've now been a Baha'i for 58 years, which kind of shocked me when I realized that's 29% of the 200 years since the birth of Baha'u'llah. Uh, I feel like I should have done more. <laughs> uh, I have had the privilege of being in the presence of nine hands of the cause. I have had access to those who were with the Guardian, with Abdul Baha, and with Baha'u'llah. I have borne witness to the completion of the administrative order. Uh, the terraces, the ark, and more recently, the global framework for action. Um, so in light of these events in my life, what does this commemoration mean to me? So let me take you on uh, my personal journey through my subjective proofs. When I was a Christian, I uh, and I still am a Christian, but when I was unaware of the Baha'i faith, I was not dissatisfied with Christianity uh, or with Christ or with the Testaments. I communed with Christ and God on a daily basis through power, uh, prayer. I remember as a young person uh, lying in bed with a Bible on my chest reading the words and, and I felt I knew what they were saying to me. 
So I wasn't one of these people who is tired of organized religion and is looking for something else. Um, uh, I had the image of Christ before me, and this is the picture that was used in our sanctuary at our church. And so uh, uh, while, of course, it's just a guesswork by the artist, still it was a meaningful image to me. And I knew all the stories from the life of Christ. Um, so I had uh, uh, an important relationship with the manifestation. I rejoiced uh, the Methodist Church uh, and the Christian Church in general has lovely, lovely hymns, and I sang them with great joy. Um, this one in particular uh, thrilled me. And uh, as I was looking at it uh, recently, I, I realized that I was, at the end of it, uh, commemorating or celebrating the Trinity, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Um, and I started thinking about what did I think of the Trinity back then? I mean, it was in my songs. It was in the, uh, uh, the Apostles' Creed that we would say every uh, Sunday. And I, and I realized the Trinity really wasn't a problem for me, and that is I never really believed that Christ was literally God in the flesh. Uh, for one thing, as I read the uh, verses from the New Testament, I uh, saw clearly that there was a distinction, distinction between what Christ said about himself and what he said about the Father. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And then another verse from John 14. I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman, or the vine dresser. So clearly, ontologically, you can't both be the vine and the farmer or the, or the uh, keeper of the vineyard. Uh, there's a difference there, and I felt I, I understood that. Same thing true with, with uh, the cross, the crucifixion. Most uh, Christians I knew uh, uh, felt that the cross was, in effect, <laughs> to to make a lousy pun, the crux of Christianity. Uh, that without the cross, there would be no Christianity because Christ died for our sins and without the cross, there would be no salvation and therefore no Christianity. And so where the, uh, the fish was the symbol of Christianity early on, the cross soon took its place uh, and symbolized this belief promulgated primarily by the writings of Paul, that Christ died to save us from our sins that we inherited from our descendancy from, uh, descendant from, uh, from Adam, uh, who, of course, according to the Old Testament, uh, sinned and we inherited his sin. Well, Ed, I never understood that. Uh, it made no logical sense to me. Um, I looked at the crucifixion more uh, like this. And I like this painting for a number of reasons. The first one is, you say, well, oh, which one is Christ? In other words, we think Christ paid such a grievous price, but then so did all the other people crucified that day. It was a common practice to crucify criminals. Uh, uh, and so to me, uh, as I say in the... Uh, slide here, he lived to help us overcome our sins. He lived. He didn't die. If he, hadn't, if he had died some other way or not, uh, if he had lived a normal life, uh, it was his teachings that were the, uh, the testament. Uh, and he brought us a vision of God, not as what had become the concept of God as a uh, um, an angry God, a, a vengeful God, a jealous God, uh, sort of a tribal ruler, uh, which was the image that worked for a tribal people. But we had at this time in our 
uh, collective history outgrown that uh, need for that uh, concept. So my introduction to the Baha'i faith provided me with a new standard for assessing Christianity and everything else I came across, whether it was in philosophy or political theories and so on. Uh, I came across this um, because of my brother, who uh, was a uh, pre-ministerial student in the Divinity School at uh, Vanderbilt University, and was uh, scheduled to go to Yale Divinity School to uh, get his doctorate in divinity. Uh, but he uh, came across the Baha'i faith and started studying it and shared what he was studying with me. And the conscious knowledge that he um, uh, shared with me uh, was the concept of the manifestation, progressive revelation, uh, and all the logical underpinnings of Baha'i theology against which nothing else makes much sense, or let me put it this way, utilizing that standard of judgment of conscious knowledge about how God works, suddenly all the mysteries that people seem to uh, relish in, uh, in the Christian church I was in, suddenly were not mysteries, they made logical sense. And so the more conscious knowledge one gets, uh, as we see in this previous, as ye have faith, so shall your powers and blessings be. This is the balance. This is the balance. So in other words, if you look at scales like this, on the one side you've got conscious knowledge, uh, and if you've got conscious knowledge, your faith, uh, you, uh, the more faith you have, the more the strength of your spiritual powers and the plenitude and potency of your divine blessings uh, will be. So th this is very important, this concept of standard or balance. So in other words, the way this is used, as you know, is if you, if you put one of those weights at the bottom there, so you put an ounce on the left side, and you start putting stuff on the right side, then whatever stuff you put, whether it's gold or dirt, you know when you've got an ounce, when it balances out. So the same thing is true with the verities and theology of Baha'u'llah. If you put progressive revelation on the left, um, then everything else makes sense. It balances out. Uh, the same thing is true with another image that the Baha'i writings use, the touchstone. That's a touchstone in the bottom, and if you rub a piece of gold over it, uh, it will leave a trace, uh, a mark, that will show whether what you've got is gold, and, it, in, and the type of color it leaves will even tell you whether it's alloyed or what the alloys are and how much uh, it is alloyed. And so we look at another passage from the Egon, which uh, alludes to this uh, analogy. Thus hath the Sadiq, son of Muhammad, I forget, I think he was the third imam, uh, has spoken, God verily will test them and sift them. This is the divine standard, again, the balance, the standard. This is the touchstone of God, wherewith he proveth his servants. None apprehendeth the meaning of these utterance except them whose hearts are assured, whose souls have found favor with God, <clears throat> and whose minds are detached from all else but him. So again, we have this idea of the standard. So, uh, we combine, uh, excuse me, we combine this concept of the standard, of the mizan, with the law of parsimony, or what's called sometimes Occam's razor, which means in studying science or any theory or uh, 
you uh, if you have uh, two descriptions or two theories about some aspect of reality, the most likely uh, the one that is most likely true is that which cuts through the morass of complexity, the one that is the simplest explanation. Uh, the best example that I know of is, is how we switch from the Ptolemaic theory, which was a geocentric theory of our solar system. Of course, it wasn't a solar system then. It was a, 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 a geocentric system. Uh, and of course, the, the Ptolemaic theory worked fine. The sun rises, the sun sets. We still use those terms. Uh, but it became convoluted, and that is the more sophisticated we became in our ability to observe the universe, and we would observe such things as the retrograde motion of Mars uh, and so on, we had to come up with explanations of how that could happen if the Earth was the center of the universe. And so we said, well, Mars must be going around something else. So it looks like it's going backwards, but it's actually uh, in this epicycle going around around us. But the more we discovered, the more it became just a mess. Uh, if you've seen some models of it when it became complex, it was it's quite, I don't want to say hilarious, because that's disdainful, and, uh, 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 but it, it was, it is. Uh, find one, on, you can go on Google and find one. So <clears throat> along comes, comes Copernicus says, why don't you try a heliocentric theory instead? And by golly, uh, all the complexity became resolved. Uh, and uh, it became uh, <clears throat> elegant uh, rather than confusing. It untangled the webs and it cut through uh, the uh, tangle of uh, confused uh, Ptolemaic theory, and in effect, that became the mizan for the assessment of the cosmos. Of course, we didn't know then about galaxies and, and galaxies rotating around the center and so on. We're still discovering these. A few logical axioms that became my touchstone or Mizan is I apply the law of parsimony and they're the obvious ones that we all love as Baha'is. The concept of the manifestation as intermediary justified the validity of all other religions. Uh, whereas as a Christian, I, um, I never thought much about the problem that, well, what about my Jewish friends? Because most of my, about a third of the people in my school were Jewish, and, and I loved uh, going to the synagogue and, and uh, talking to them about religion and so on, and I didn't think them any rest less religious than me. Well, the concept of the manifestation uh, sort of um, negated the concept of Christ as the single or, uh, or the only or the last uh, messenger from God, which would not, would, to me, does not make much sense and did not then. So that was a great gift. That was a law of parsimony for the complexity of religions. The concept of the manifestation demystified the Trinitarian doctrine. Though it hadn't been much of a mystery to me, it was to a lot of people. And it did so really uh, uh, when I understood the, um, uh, the uh, ringstone symbol, which is also can be looked at as sort of a Trinitarian view of reality in the sense of, of uh, the heavenly realm, the realm of the manifestation, and, and the human realm. Um, and then the concept of progressive revelation, which of course is the, the central tenet of, of our belief uh, as Baha'is. God at work in history. Suddenly I understood that history was the story of God at work. Uh, it provided a rational uh, explanation of how there could be one religion, the religion of God, but revealed in progressive and successive stages. 
Uh, so uh, no longer did I see conflict uh, between religions as anything but confusion wrought by uh, faulty interpretations and understandings by men and women, by humankind. The concept of the day, um, I love the, the idea of the cycles that are talked about in the Baha'i faith, the cycle of a dispensation or an era, the uh, prophetic cycle as a cycle of cycles. Uh, and no doubt there are greater cycles that we will understand as, uh, as time goes on. But particularly this day as the cycle in which the maturation of humankind will occur explained to me what I was observing in the world news and the uh, increasing uh, attempt with the United Nations and other uh, organizations to both recognize and uh, serve the world as one country. Another proof I had, a subjective proof, were the followers. And this relates back, of course, to the one I'd mentioned earlier from the Gan about souls will arise in the name of the manifestation who will exhibit the spiritual attributes. Well, I was very fortunate that I was in the Nashville community because uh, my brother, by the time I went to college, had become a Baha'i the year before. And so in that community, um, I learned about the faith, not by studying the texts, uh, because not all that many were translated at that time, but Gleanings was there certainly and various others, but, and the writings of the Guardian. But uh, I chose to learn by talking to these people. Anything I needed to know, I could, I could uh, talk to them. Uh, and that's how I tested the verities. I'd say, well, what about, what about Muhammad? Was, was he a manifestation? They'd say, yes, uh, and so on. And so any question I had, uh, I would go to them rather than to some answered questions or gleanings and so on. I'm not saying this was a wise thing I did. It was just so easy. And so once I moved away from Nashville, I became quite tested. And uh, I had to use some other uh, mizan rather than the people. But these people, uh, my brother and his wife, Mag Carney, became a Baha'i while I was there. She was taught by Sarah Pereira, who was uh, on the National Assembly, and then became an auxiliary board member at the time when the auxiliary board members were serving hands of the cause. There was no... Uh, um, um, uh, Continental Councils at, at that time. Dr. Robert Hayden, who first um, African-American Port Laureate. His wife, Irma, who was a concert pianist and a teacher. Casey and Alice Walton, who were just lovely people and happened to be the parents of uh, House Member Paul Lample's wife. Uh, and uh, Winston Evans, who was had an assignment by uh, the hands of the cause and by the NSA to teach the cause to people of, of note, uh, uh, dignitaries, uh, particularly theologians, and so on. Roy and Georgia Miller, who uh, would take me an hour to describe, but suffice to say they were just they exemplified Baha'i love in its most wonderful and joyful and intimate sense. Lovely people. She had, uh, she learned to read as a, by becoming a Baha'i. And uh, um, she had to be taught the faith by subterfuge, by pretending to be a domestic in the house of a Baha'i so she could learn about the faith because I think she was in Alabama or Mississippi before such a thing would have been allowed. So, from all this so far in my subjective experience, I realized something that I, or I had uh, confirmed to my satisfaction what I had always believed, that logic and reason are indispensable to religion and religious belief because God 
is intelligent and rational, and therefore his ways in teaching us must also be intelligently and logically devised. And God's religions must also therefore be rational and in accord with one another, that any uh, a conflict either is dealing with the change in laws or with misunderstandings. And that the faith in God must be based on rational axioms, the Mazan again. That faith without deeds is mere words, as James says in the Bible, it, it is a thing quite dead. And of course, there again, we go back to what we read very early from uh, uh, the definition of faith. Faith is knowledge with, uh, with deeds. Uh, and the concept of progress, progressive revelation is the sole logical methodology to explain God's plan. Nothing else does. And uh, uh, it alone enlightens and forms and provides the key that unlocks the scriptures of every religion. And religious belief based on blind faith alone is largely superstition and destined to falter and fail. So, I had uh, exposure to these people. I exposure to these verities, some of which were subjected, some of which were objective. And uh, this is what occurred. I now knew more precisely who Christ really was which was very important to me because and then I could go back to the scriptures and I really understood what he was saying in a way that I hadn't before. So I could now resolve the enigmas of what had been my Christian beliefs. For example, when Christ say, I am, says, I am the way, no one cometh unto the Father but by me, I could understand what that meant. The second coming, the ascension, the symbolism of the Last Supper, the self-sufficiency of God, all these became clear to me. Uh, and once exposed to that truth, I, I could not tolerate anything else. So it, again, going back to the beginning, I wasn't looking for something else. Uh, but once exposed to it, I couldn't turn away from it. Um, I couldn't pretend I didn't know what I knew. Um, and the, the rest of these same things on the page. I could understand the real meaning of the Trinity, and I, I, I did reread the scriptures. I still do, and I still discover things that, uh, uh, that show that Christ was not only aware of progressive revelation, but was uh, articulating it in no uncertain terms. So, for example, and these are just my own ideas that came to me as a result of this, I, I started uh, coming up with ideas of my own, or at least I don't know they're my own, but uh, they felt like it at the time. The third day he rose from the dead. Well, what if that's referring to the days of the manifestations? The writings use the term day to refer to a dispensation. So, on the third day, Christ arose from the dead, the second coming. Uh, again, something we could discuss for an hour, but we don't have an hour. We only have a few minutes. Peter was the first pope to deny Christ. He denied Christ three times before the rooster crowed, something Christ said he would do, and he said, I would never, I would never do that. But he did. The day of Muhammad, the day of the Bab, the day of Baha'u'llah, who writes a letter to the pope, who rejects him? You know, just my own thoughts. You can do with it. But the point is, I took joy in studying the scriptures in a way. I, I, whereas before, it had been sort of an intuitive relationship with the Father through his word. Now it made sense to me. This is a very famous quote that a lot of Baha'is refer to, as you'll see uh, the very last uh, part of this phrase, before Abraham was, I am, which acknowledges that Christ was pre-existent, which ties into the guardian's description of the ontology of the prophets. They're not just ordinary human beings. They are specialized beings who are created in the world of the spirit and exist there before coming 
to uh, be born into this world, whereas our beginning takes its place during the process of conception. Uh, again, this uh, I don't want to go into this in detail, but I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, um, and then on down, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Well, you can see why someone would say, well, if you see him, you see the Father, he must be the Father. You can see why the problem arose. Um, but you can see as this goes on that he distinguished his own identity from that of the Father. And of course, he is the way and the truth. Each manifestation says the same thing, and each one speaketh the truth. Uh, that at the time they appear, they are the way. This very important quote, uh, which helped me a, a great deal. No distinction do we make between any of his messengers. And the he that revealed that is uh, Muhammad. Uh, so the manifestations are have two stations. One is that they are essentially the same in what their mission is, uh, their essential unity, and yet they each come at a different time with a different message for a different uh, condition. Well, when I became an isolated believer, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, simply go to my learned friends and say, what's the meaning of this or what's the answer to this? And so I had to start studying. Uh, and my main problem was the transference of my allegiance from the image of Christ to the image of Baha'u'llah, uh, whom I had never seen, nor really read his writings uh, studiously. Uh, uh, with Baha'u'llah, it wasn't a problem, uh, as it isn't for most of us. We, this was my favorite picture of Abu Baha. I kept it with me all the time, and I felt comforted, and I felt that this was the image I could relate to. And the Guardian says there's no problem with that. that, that that's fine if you want to think of the image of Baha'u'llah, of Abu Baha when you pray and so on. Uh, Whereas Baha'u'llah seemed more re remote, severe, and unapproachable to me when I started studying on my own. And the reason for that is very simple. The first book, unfortunately for me, or not unfortunately for me, the first book that the Nashville Baha'is gave me, and I'll finish up in a second here, I see my time is about up, was Epistle to the Son of the Wolf. And I presume most of you have read this, but uh, the tone of it is... Uh, is quite severe because he's talking to the son of one who's responsible for the martyrdom of some of the most sterling Baha'is at the time. Uh, and so he, uh, I, you know, I treated it like the Bible, uh, as I would the Bible. I just open up to a page and start reading, and, and I, he's talking to me very, very harshly. Well, of course, he's not talking to me. He's talking to the son of the wolf. Uh, but I didn't read the introduction, and I didn't get that. And also, he talked a lot about how much he was suffering, and I thought, well, uh, if he's a manifestation of God, why is he complaining? You know, and, and then I, I read later, you know, uh, that he was uh, 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 talking about this in a very special context, and that is, uh, uh, if I wanted to, I, I, I. Uh, consented to be bound in chains that mankind might be freed. So I had to establish study for myself because I could no longer rely on the knowledge of others, and that brings to mind, of course, to all of us. The best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. Turn not away therefrom if thou desirest me, and neglect it not that I may confide in thee. By its aid thou shalt see with thine own eyes and not through the eyes of others and shalt know of, know of thine own knowledge, and not through the knowledge of thy neighbor. Ponder this in thy heart, how it behooveth thee to be. Verily, justice is my gift to thee, and the sign of my loving kindness. Set it then before thine eyes. And what I began to realize, that as wonderful as these people were, I couldn't be spiritual because of them. As Baha'u'llah says in the Gleanings, no man's spirituality is conditioned by another. 
In other words, no one can become spiritual for you as much as they might want to. Uh, this is a thing I, I like to, to talk about. Like the proof of the friend in Tasmania who loves you or a proof of the existence of God. If, if someone said there's someone in Tasmania who loves you a lot and I can prove it to you, uh, um, it wouldn't mean anything. You wouldn't have a relationship. The same thing if you could prove the existence of God. And, and of course, my, when his own work, my brother does this. But that doesn't necessarily instill in you or evoke in you a love of God or a sense of nearness to God. That only way we can achieve that, the guardian says, is through the manifestations. And so I realized that in order to have a love relationship with God through the manifestation or with Baha'u'llah, I had to treat it the same way I would any other relationship in which I was trying to establish a love relationship. I needed daily conversation and communion with this friend because I no longer had the constant companion of the dear ones. I needed to understand and appreciate what the friend had been through and what qualities the friend possessed. I needed to hear all the various things the friend had to say to me and what guidance he had to give. It mattered little what the friend might look like because appearances change over time and we certainly were only guessing about the parents of Christ. Well, one final test of proof remained, though there would be many others uh, they, and I, God willing, they will never cease because that's the only way we grow. The test of Muhammad, and this is the end. Um, I had never talking about back then uh, in the 50s nobody discussed islam much in the west um, certainly no christians but i had according to the writings and according to the friends i had known in nashville accept them as co-equal in station with baha'u'llah whom i was only beginning to know i had to accept him as being co-equal in station with christ with whom i had had an abiding love relationship and still had I had to accept his revelation as possessing an impact on human history perhaps greater than what Christ had accomplished. I had to accept his revealed word as true and as emanating from God, but I had never seen his word. And so it was with great uh, fear and trembling that I picked up the Quran and lo and behold, uh, I must have been divinely guided because this is one of the first things I found where he explains that don't believe in the literal Trinitarian doctrines. The Christians are wrong about that, who say that. He says, say not, Trinity, desist. There's only one God, and far be it from him to have a literal son. Christ disdaineth not to serve and worship God. In other words, Christ is not God. In fact, it's his honor to serve God. And then another the uh, uh, thing that uh, confirmed uh, Muhammad for me uh, was when I started reading uh, uh, the Egon, uh, I came across very early, so this is page five and six, that Baha'u'llah says, to them that are possessed with true understanding insight, the surah of Hud surely sufficeth. And what he's saying is that if you read the Surah of Hood, you will find a description of progressive revelation. And if you understand that, that's all you need uh, to understand, to have your mizan. And so I read the Surah of Hood. We sent Noah. We sent Moses and so on. And so I realized that Muhammad not only understood progressive revelation, but talks about nothing else throughout the, uh, the Quran. And so it was that Baha'u'llah and his teachings became my mizan, and he came, my, became my most intimate compassion, the standard by which I took myself into account each day, the standard by which I made critical choices in my life the standard by which I could understand what was happening in the world, the standard by which I could decide how best to dedicate my 
life, my energies and actions. The standard by which I could regulate everything I think, every course of action I undertake, and the means by which I prepare myself for the transition to the afterlife. So, we must think for ourselves because Baha'u'llah doesn't reveal a canon of law, but a standard. So where Baha'u'llah was once remote, he became my most intimate friend, and every minute of every day I commune with him, whether I'm happy or sad or confused or bewildered. Oh, Baha'u'llah, when I'm joyful. Oh, Baha'u'llah, when I am suffering. Oh, Baha'u'llah, when something goes right. Oh, Baha'u'llah, when something goes wrong. I'm going to skip over that uh, quote because I'm out of time. I will leave time for questions. But this is a passage where Abu Baha says that once Baha'u'llah was released from this world, his soul could energize the whole world to a degree unapproached at any stage in the course of his existence on this planet. In other words, Baha'u'llah is quite alive, quite active, and I'm certainly active in my own life. Well, happy bicentenary. Well, Rob, if there are any questions that... Uh, if we have any time that you can convey, I will be happy to attempt to uh, to answer them, though this was a, a most personal sort of thing and not uh, a scholarly presentation. Perhaps it, uh, it has some meaning. It certainly had meaning for me to put it together uh, because I had to think about what it did mean to me. Well, thank you, John. I, um, I must say I was, I was very moved especially there at the end when you start noting the old Baha'u'llahs for all the different situations. Well, it's true. I, I, there's a friend of mine, uh, he's deceased now, but he worked with the Guardian for 17 years in the Holy Land, Shokola Oshi. He was the grandson of the cook, Baha'u'llah's cook. Right. And every, uh, whenever he was with friends, he'd say, oh, Baha. And he would just say it to himself, but it was like you could tell he was always saying it, regardless of what was happening. And I realized, you know, and and uh, it wasn't because of him I started doing it. I just, it just naturally occurred, and I find myself doing it all the time. I find myself doing precisely that whenever I think back at events in my past life that I regret. Oh, yes. Those are the constantly <laughs> think, oh, Allah, oh, Allah. Uh, very good day. point. Very yeah. good point. Um, really, I, I thank you very much. This was really a marvelous, really marvelous and moving presentation. And let's see if I can't get these this question section to open up. Um, you have lived through so much in terms of the development of the faith. And goodness, the, almost the entire era of the Universal House of Justice, you began by what two years after the passing of the Guardian? Yes, uh, that's, that's exactly correct. Yeah, and you know what's funny too is, uh, you, you know, we think globally as Baha'is, but we live locally, and that's another talk I can give for a couple of hours. But my point is that uh, uh, you know when Macy Remy, Mason Remy declared himself the second guardian. I think it was in Nauru's of 61, as I recall. Uh, I think I was in Spain at the time. Well, it, it doesn't matter. The point is that uh, I'd get my Baha'i news, which went around the world, and, uh, you know, and I wasn't even aware of it, <laughs> which is a crazy thing to think that here the whole foundation of the faith was attempted to be shaken by this individual. But at the local level, we didn't talk about it or anything. And then I, so later on when I, I was, I, I kept all my behind news and I looked back and I thought, well, it must have been in there. And so I looked back at the, at the telegram from the uh, Hands of Cause in the Holy Land, who were the nine individuals elected by the other hands to, in effect, be in charge of the faith. And there it was, you know, uh, this uh, 
the whole telegram about Mason Remy, and we are all praying for his soul, the progress of his soul, and so on. But it's it, it's funny that yes, I I lived through all those things, but I was I'm more attentive to them now than I was when they happened. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true, and I think that's true of many of these uh, internal crises. Actually, I think most Baha'is aren't worrying about them or are don't think about them or want or wonder about them. Frankly, well, and if, I mean, all the good things too. I'm talking about the very positive things as well. I, you know, the uh, when I was on pilgrimage in, in 1972, in December of 72, they used to back then uh, on pilgrimage they would save some juicy bit of information to give to the pilgrims that the rest of the world didn't know yet. And so I remember uh, meeting with Ian Semple, the pilgrims were one, uh, and he says, uh, and he told us that what the House of Justice had just decided was to build a seat of the House of Justice. Uh-huh. And so, and, and, you know, and so it was just a pipe dream then, and, but to see it being built, and, you know, we used to receive those slideshows and then the films and so on of the construction of it. And, uh, so as I say, it's it's. I I went on uh, went on a, a pilgrimage a year ago last summer, and and to see all of the, what had become in the years since 1972 when I'd been been there, and the only buildings, of course, were the uh, the Shrine of the Bob and the Archives Building, and the, and the uh, I. Uh, it was just astounding. I, I, the first thing I thought to myself, now this is something worth investing my money in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a substantial enterprise. <laughs> it is, and you can see that in the Baha'u'llah film. But the movie is now available with the the flyovers over the properties, too. You really get a, a sense of what oh, they Oh, yes. Yeah. They make wow. great, great use of the drones. Oh, yeah. boy, did they. An incredible, incredible sense of what we've been able to accomplish. I remember I first saw the terraces in 2000, right before the dedication from the top. I looked down. I said, we built the Garden of Eden. We built a symbol of paradise on Earth. Yeah. It was just so beautiful. Yeah. Um, we do have a couple of comments. Um, I think there'd be more, more comments and questions, but... Uh, We'll probably get some questions as well. Okay. Natalie says, a joyful experience, a toolbox of inspiration. I like that expression. Thank you. And uh, Perjaya has a question. Thank you so much for your insights. What did you mean by Baha'u'llah did not reveal a canon of law? Excuse me again here. Well, he uh, he says it himself. He says, uh, um, oh, what is the phrase? Uh, um, Thank not that we have revealed... Uh, Code of law. The code of law. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we and he goes on to give the images of the the choice wine that we have unsealed the choice wine with the fingers of might and power and and uh, and so on. Uh, the of course we have the synopsis and codification included. Of course, it was released in seventy two and it's included in the Kadaviyagdas. And the reason the Guardian. Uh, of course, had us uh, had that as a requirement. Uh, he did most of it, but uh, uh, why it's important is it organizes the laws as they're revealed. Uh, really, the uh, Agdas is sort of like a poem that it's you have this beautiful imagery and so on, and suddenly there's a law. But so you have to sort of extricate the laws from the poetry and from the other discussion discussion going on. Uh, but that's not what I mean, that it's not codified. It is codified, but a, he, he doesn't reveal a canon. A canon of law means uh, th- th- something like the church, the Catholic church has, where you have laws for every situation in your life and, uh, and so on. What he has revealed more, more uh, uh, than a canon of law is a system for making laws and decisions. And this is both the institutions, the election of the institutions, and the consultative process. So instead of uh, having, uh, uh, so in, in other words, each situation is considered on its own merit rather than trying to have 
a law for every little single thing in your life. So if you, so for example, laws of punishment, well, in most religions, you have all kinds of laws punishing you for this and that. There are only four laws for which explicit punishment uh, is explained in the Agnes. Uh, and even those have alternatives. You could do this or you could do this or this, meaning it's up to the institution to consult on the exigencies of a particular situation, and then it will decide what is the most appropriate response. Right. Right. Uh, and the same thing with the ability of the House of Justice to create their own laws and then abrogate those laws as they're no longer appropriate. Uh, what he's created is a sis is systems for making laws as they become necessary and so on, more than a, a strict a strict canon. Um, right. uh, in fact, I'm no said, Talmud, no Talmud, no Sharia. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's possibly she's also referring to the word canon because a lot of people think that refers to something that goes boom, but in this particular case, it's the Greek word referring to a, like a sacred collection and not piece of artillery. But I'm not sure if that was the question she's asking either. Uh, Lois says, as always, you teach and enlighten us. Thank you for sharing. Lois and Richard send that to you. Thank and, you, Lois. I hope to see you soon. Yeah, Lois Singer, you may know her. I and, do indeed. They, they are lovely Baha'is who live here uh, in our area. Well, that's and, good. Uh, they became Baha'is after being uh, of the Jewish faith most of their lives, and they took book one, and in book two they declared, and they have been a, a tremendous assistance to our community. They, more than anybody I've ever taught, showed me the, the, the value and efficacy of the Urui uh, mm -hmm. process, of the, the framework for action. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, Arane asks about the availability of the Baha'u'llah film not until October 18th, but the well, that's when it's going to be available live over the web. The DVDs were just mailed to the local spiritual assemblies, and that's what John yes, and I, yes. um, I, I got one because my wife is secretary of our uh, registered group. Right, and our assembly got ours on Friday. That's what, what we were referring to. Uh, turning to the Facebook page, uh, Irina says, incredible talk, loved it. Thank you, John Hatcher, Allahu Abba from the UK. Oh, thank you. See, and Barbara also says, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation. So that's uh, a few other. Um, right, well, don't, read, don't read any of the ones that are critical. <laughs> there, are no, there are no critical ones. Ah, uh, good. There are no critical ones. <laughs> no, this is really, really John, marvelous. Um, and I think it reminds me very much of Baha'u'llah's, or is it Baha'u'llah? Yeah, in the Akdas, I guess, where it says that we should not only write a will disposing of our property, but also a testament testifying to our faith. And I, I think... I didn't know that. Huh? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your will should also include a testament of your faith. This is why... Isn't that in the notes or something? I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it is, actually. And maybe it's not in the Akdas, but at any rate, um, this oh. is why people always would say the guardian, the guardian had no personal made up. <laughs> No, no, the guardian had no personal property to give away or to dispose of, so he didn't need a will in that sense. And the end of his Allah was his was his testament. Well, and of course we designate uh, in our wills who should be our uh, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the person who takes care of your estate. Uh, the, uh, I keep wanting to say air, but that's not the right word either. Oh, no, you can't think of it either. You're getting old as I am. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, I have a, about a decade, a little over, more than a decade to catch up, I'm afraid, on you. All but, right. Well, uh, but it seemed to me what you did today very much was precisely that um, testament that uh, we're called upon to do. And uh, executor, someone says executor. There we go. Thank you. Immediately have provided us with the, the answer to that. Regina and Betty have both immediately typed in executor. So, uh, but I want to thank you because what, you, what you've done really has given us uh, a, a personal testament to your faith in Baha'u'llah. And, and I think that that is it's very moving and it also is a good example to us of uh, where, where we are at spiritually and where we can go.
Well, it's particularly easy to make a testament when you leave out the bad parts. <laughs> well, I don't know if testified any of the bad parts I, anyway. I want you to find that passage for me so I can be sure that I don't have to put in all the places where I screwed up. That's, that's called bringing bring yourself into account each day, John. <laughs> Exactly. I don't have to write it down so that's right. you can read it. <laughs> I'll uh, explain this to my executor. <laughs> Mary says, did John ever question the existence of God? And no, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about expressing the how I should, but the quality of one's faith, perhaps. Uh, and 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 I I found it quite moving to to, to hear yours today, and 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 I really I thank you very much for that. Well, if she's actually asking me, did I ever? And the and uh, okay. the fact is, I did not. The fact is, I was raised by uh, religiously by my mother, who was an extraordinary individual who became a Baha'i when she was 93 years old, and she knew what she was doing. I looked at her books, and I still look at them. She had had them for years. She learned about the faith as soon as I did. Uh, but uh, her life history needs to be told. But uh, she was an extraordinary woman, and she uh, was by no means uh, a martinet when it came to teaching me religion. She was very, very, she had a good sense of interpreting scripture and so on. In fact, she was the head of the junior department which we would now call uh, the junior youth age at the church, and she was incredibly creative. So I'm not saying that I, that if you have a good parent, you necessarily believe in God, but uh, I, it never occurred to me to, to, to doubt it. Uh, and I'm not saying that I'm not bragging. I'm just saying uh, it didn't. I, thank God I didn't have to, to, uh, to go through that uh, yeah. that test. Sure, that's different. People have a different co collection or se selection of tests. I never thought about the existence of God. I, I never considered that He didn't exist. I just sort of assumed that's exactly what I mean. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really think about a God at all, particularly before I became a Baha'i. But I didn't think that He didn't exist. I just sort of assumed He did. It just didn't didn't matter to me. I guess you could say particularly much. But I wasn't raised in as devout a household as you were. I was raised, raised in much more of a secular household, I guess. Well, then, then that's amazing what you've accomplished. I mean, that's, to go from there to where you are now is wonderful. Well, um, and, and I, I thank you for your 24 or 25 books. That's <laughs> more yeah. well, than we can keep up with, John, but that's okay. <laughs> Well, I'm pretty much, I've got one more book coming out, and I've, then I've said pretty much everything I have to say, I think. Uh, uh, everything I've James, been James says, uh, page 109 in the Kitabi Akhtas, you'll see about the uh, Testament writing down oh, your okay. There it is. And then back over to our Facebook page here, Rex says, I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Um, I can't believe the similarities in our lives. I just turned 70 because I became a Baha'i in 1966 in Casper, Wyoming at the age of nearly 19. The LSA decided uh, to have a youth conference and asked me to give a talk on the epistles of the Son of the Wolf two months later. So he went through a similar, <laughs> similar experience. And Bobby says, thank you from Wisconsin. Love the explanation of the development of our personal relationship with Baha'u'llah and the idea of the power of his soul in our world today and let's see we also have an um, example of a testament in a will someone is giving an example of what he wrote I guess I bear witness herein to the oneness of God in this time of the dispensation of Baha'u'llah to whom I declare my absolute belief and devotion that's that's a good example of it. Oh, very nice. well I'm I'm good. Good. Number, number paragraph 109 in the Akhtas of course, it means now that I've got to pay my lawyer a, a few bucks to add those sentences at the uh, uh, at the at the beginning of it or the just, preamble. Just add a link. Just add a link to to our our YouTube channel to your talk. That's all you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> You'll want to. You will. Oh, he'll charge me for that too. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, um, I think we could probably wrap this up. Uh, again, another person says thank you for a wonderful talk, and uh, we're certainly all at your, in your debt, John, for this uh, really marvelous presentation that gives us all a good start for the bicentenary, I think you could say. And I'm not quite sure when. Uh, uh, a lot of people have had observances already, actually. Obviously, next weekend is the most important observance, observances in most places, but uh, the, the uh, process, the schedule has already begun. Um, so, well, thank you, and I've, I've, I always enjoy uh, working with you. And uh, I think uh, again, what you've done with the, the Wilmot Institute uh, is, uh, will stand you in good stead for, for a long time to come, my friend. Thank you very much. <laughs>